our time, let's go ahead and get started. Um, hello, everyone, again. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to uh, today's session. My name is Fernando, and I come with the Region 9 Head Start Association, and I will be your webinar host today. So if you have any questions regarding any connection, audio, or um, any technical difficulties you may experience throughout today's session, feel free to send me a uh, chat message, and I'm happy to troubleshoot as much as I can behind the scenes. Um, please note that do through the current situation with COVID-19, our webinar platform Zoom is experiencing a lot of traffic. So if you experience any uh, lag or any connection issues today, we apologize in advance. Um, this webinar session uh, is being recorded and will be made available on both video format on our YouTube channel, as well as as an online course via continue.com. So please note that in order to receive continuing education units today, uh, you will need to take the course um, and complete its exam via the continue.com platform. Uh, links to all of these uh, recordings will be available on our website. So I will take it um, to the chat to share that link with you all throughout the session so you have it handy and can access it at any time. Um, also resources will be tied uh, to this session. The resources that are tied to this session will be available on our website as well. And again, I will be sharing that link with you uh, today. Uh, now here is the uh, Region 9 Head Start Association's Executive Director, Edward Condon, for some welcome remarks. Take it away, Ed. Good, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Region 9 uh, webinar. I'm watching the chat and just love to see the broad engagement from Guam to Hawaii, uh, into Arizona, to Tennessee, Florida, Oklahoma. So we're so glad that you're with us. We're so pleased that these webinars that we've been offering are of value to you, to your teams, and we hope, of course, to the families that you continue to serve so well during this pandemic. Today, uh, we are very honored to have uh, three wonderful panelists, Dr. Norman Lorenz, Patricia Chase, and Doreen Fisher. Um, I will say these three uh, characters have come to us. Uh, through a variety of relationships, but have really gelled together to put on a wonderful uh, training series for you this afternoon, this morning. And I know that you'll be appreciative of all the hard work they've put in uh, to building this session up. Uh, I also want to emphasize our appreciation for our relationship with continued.com, our partner in these webinars. You'll learn at the end of the webinar that uh, you'll be able to receive continuing education units through uh, taking this course on continued where you can receive those certificates. So in addition to the professional development hours that we offer uh, through our webinar series, you'll also be able to take this for CEU credits. And Fernando will give you information on how that's uh, obtained at the end of this broadcast. Uh, so again, thanks to Norman, to Tricia, and to Doreen for your time. Thanks to uh, continued for their partnership. And of course, thanks to my team, Natalie and Fernando, who work so hard to make these quality presentations. So with that, I wish you all well and uh, enjoy the presentation. Fernando? Thank you, Ed. Um, so now uh, here's Natalie Medina with the Region 9 Head Start Association with a few comments about our Q&A process today. Hello, everyone. My name is Natalie and I come with the Region 9 Head Start Association. I will be overseeing the Q&A for today's session. If you have any questions that pertain to the material being provided in today's session, we ask that you please use the Q&A button, which you'll find next to the chat button. If it pertains, if time pertains, we will answer a few questions live. When submitting a question, we please ask the following, that you specify who the question is directed to, whether it's to Doreen, Trisha, or Norman. Um, your question, and as well as leaving some way of contacting you, preferably through email. Please note that the Q&A is public and all the participants will be able to see your contact information. If your question is not answered during the live session, our speakers for today will answer them after the session is over via email. That is why it is so important to leave a contact. With all that being said, please give your full attention to Dr. Norman Lawrence. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you to Head Start. Thank you to Continued Ed. Uh, I'm in the process of sharing the screen. Uh, in partnership with Region 9, as well as with Continued Ed, uh, we are very uh, honored to be here today to speak with you 
about talking with children about grief and loss. Uh, and with that, uh, Tricia will uh, do her first introduction. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Tricia Chase. I am from Phoenix, Arizona. I'm currently a clinical therapist at a community-based agency, Bayless Integrated Healthcare, along with being a mental health consultant for Child Crisis Arizona. So I work with kids anywhere from the zero to 20 some age range. Doreen, you're up. Okay, I'm Doreen Fisher and I'm the mental health coordinator for Fresno EOC Head Start. And I serve uh, the, the entire Head Start population and uh, supporting the teachers, students and families. Thank you both. And I'll follow up uh, again. My name is Dr. Norman Lorenz. I'm a professor of education studies, primarily at Sacramento City College, as well as a Montessori educator, where I am a, an adjunct professor with Sarasota University. And in relationship to today's conversation, it came about through some dialogue uh, with Mr. Condon in relationship to what we're experiencing, certainly not only during this pandemic time, but at all points of planes of growth across life experience. And that is that we experience grief. And uh, certainly as someone who teaches uh, in the education field, uh, more specifically a human development class, over the past years, uh, it has become evident to me that at preconception for which we conceive, we birth, we grow, we live throughout our uh, childhood and adulthood, that there are points in time that we've all experienced the word no. And when no comes about, we have this moment or this uh, time, uh, oftentimes we hope that it's momentary, that we think, you said no to me? It means I can't do this? And, and underneath the surface, there is this incredible uh, process of grief going on. And so today's experience over the next hour is to essentially um, speak about that relationship in regard to the value that we experience as far as grief is concerned. So with that, we will move into the presentation and uh, Tricia will uh, give us our description and objectives. Thank you, Norman. Um, so as he brought up today, we're kind of focusing on trauma and loss and how that affects um, children and how the people who work with them, parents, um, therapists, teachers, um, anybody who really comes in contact with them, especially currently, um, dealing with how to handle, express, and allow them to feel comfortable enough to talk about their grief. Um, so today we're kind of going to go over a little bit of background about what grief is, some options for you guys as far as how to help them, some activities, some background into the process of grief, and all the different stages that we come across um, from birth to death as Norman had mentioned. So let's get started. So we will be looking at four essential uh, learning outcomes and uh, Doreen will start us off. Okay, first we're going to define what grief and loss is. And then the second would be to, we're going to describe activities that can be used to support children who are grieving. Um, we're going to identify some, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, um, and, and what I'll spend time doing is looking at the theoretical standpoint, looking at the physiological, the social, the emotional, and then uh, Trisha, I'll, I'll kind of hand it off to her to talk about that mental grief and loss based on the clinical features of grief and loss. And then finally, uh, the stages of loss based on the various models, including uh, Dr. Kubler-Ross. So with that, what we focus on initially is those theoretical concepts. And we won't spend an inordinate amount of time here because 
what we want to be able to demonstrate today in our role as panelists is to provide opportunity to help assist you as participants with practices, practices that you can take home today that you can begin to implement. However, providing a guide to each of you, whether you're working uh, as administrative uh, leaders or uh, facilitators and trainers of individuals, both in the faculty and staff roles and or uh, those working directly with children and parents, we, we first look at the bioecological model and you will find in the references uh, these captured as well as through the illustrations that will uh, illuminate a bit more uh, in the presentation. And the first one would be the, the, the construct of the bioecological model. Uh, Yuri Braffenbrenner was someone uh, initially very integrally involved with the inception of Head Start and looked at disproportionately impacted uh, children across the economies of the United States. And that bioecological model we'll talk about is the fact that at the very center of all of our focus is the child. And that from the child, we then move out in concentric circles to foster support and, and structure. So that's the first one. The second one is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And in this case, uh, Abraham Maslow's hierarchy, we'll look at the specific details of what builds our foundations. So if I were to use a metaphor such as building a house, we certainly, in order to put the roof on it, must have the foundation first and then the walls and then the roof. We can't simply start with the roof. So in this case, we're, we're going to be looking at the relationship to the child, and the child within the family, and then the family within community and school environment. And then certainly taking a look at the current pandemic hierarchy, uh, there is a model that you could look at uh, on your own. As we, as we look at the bioecological model then, based on Yuri Braffenbrenner's uh, theoretical framework, we look at the very smallest circle, which in reality is the most important right because that's where the 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 child where that's where you and i we if anything we have learned across this particular time in the world is that we are one race of human beings in the animal kingdom and and to some degree there are even other animals outside of the species of humans that are susceptible to this particular pandemic but all the while the individual's knowledge, skills, motivation of the individual is, is uh, attributed based on when you then begin to look at those other uh, uh, larger frameworks, the interpersonal piece where relationship, a social and emotional growth, the organizational and institutional where the intrapersonal features of rules and regulations and organizations such as schools, such as the design model of Head Start looking at the health and welfare of the family and the children and how that exerts itself into the physical, the social, the emotional and cognitive realm of the child's learning. Equally having affect on his or her or their families and then reaching beyond that the community such as Trisha, Doreen and myself being community resources that help to promote what he refers to as these social norms. And then finally, the largest feature, which ideally has the full impact to the individual and the intrapersonal features of being in community with one another, are our state and federal policies, both from the local level all the way up to the federal. In relationship to that, then we look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And I think this is clearly where, as each of you looks at these various levels, the construct of our most basic needs are those physiological ones. And again, from a theoretical sense, we can say all that we want about uh, breathing, and yet in current time, that's where the pandemic has struck people uh, in such an adverse way. And so how does that connect 
in relationship to if we don't have our physiological framework in play, what kinds of grief and loss uh, may these pieces actually promote. Next is the level of safety. Further, we get to the depth of love and belonging, that valuing the formation of our own sense of esteem. And again, that's where the construct comes back to the individual. The value of self-actualization, looking at our morality, creativity, spontaneity, within the construct of problem solving is really where leadership takes place. And that's the construct of being able to think critically uh, and to make decisions. And, and then certainly dealing with the moral compass of whether or not there exists a sense of equity versus uh, prejudice or a lack thereof. Those are the values that uh, Maslow speaks to in reference to acceptance of these facts. So at this point, uh, we then identify these relationships from a theoretical sense to what is actually grief and loss. Uh, grief being that it, it is a uh, normal emotion, a physical emotion, a behavioral reaction to loss. Loss itself may be that of uh, a person or a thing or a relationship or situation. And so, uh, in, in fact, grief and loss are the content but bereavement is the action. It's the, in this case, it's the reaction of the survivor to the death and or loss of a family member, the death or loss of a close friend, or the death or loss of a colleague or a coworker. But could you also grieve through a bereavement process for which you may lose a thing or lose a relationship or something that doesn't kill you potentially has the opportunity to make you stronger? And so that's really where we want to focus today's information on the fact that grief is universal. Yes, it was originally by Dr. Kubler-Ross looked at in relationship to the dying process and death. However, when we look at mental health, and Tricia will speak about that, Doreen will look more specifically into the construct of how do we assist the child, is that everyone experiences some form or loss or trauma within their lifetime, hence trauma-informed care. That's truly the coined phrase that we're hearing in the construct of not only this pandemic, but certainly uh, looking across the equitization of marginalized groups. And certainly we also know that Head Start is premier in addressing those elements from the standpoint of uh, economic features, and uh, living and community features and career path uh, activities. So with that, uh, we'll uh, proceed and look at these in relationship to these normal reactions. And uh, Doreen, you're going to take us. Okay. Well, the normal reactions are feelings, thoughts, and behaviors. So we're gonna talk about feelings, thoughts, and behaviors of children and adults. So we can move on. And, and actually, um, before we go there, uh, just to step back for just a moment, when we talk about these normal reactions to grief, um, Tricia, can you speak just a bit about the construct of denial in relationship to these normal reactions? In relationship to the five indicators that we'll look at, we want to first explain to our participants the construct of grief as it relates to denial. So denial is that in, sometimes that initial reaction to, sh it's shock a lot of the times that I can't believe this is happening. Did this actually happen? How am I going to process that sitting, waiting, thinking through what just happened? Um, in reference to the current situation, it, an example would be a child who was told school is no longer going to happen for the rest of the school year. Um, and being in denial and saying, no, 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 when I, when I wake up on Monday morning, I'll be able to go see my friends, my teachers, everything will be normal. Come Monday morning, you know, reality sets in in a way and it's wrapping your head around that really did just happen to me. So it's slowly processing 
this information and, and denying that it's really happening because in the moment it's not tangible until you know, you get to a certain point where there is no more denying. It's a right in the face. I nothing. Everything's changed, and I don't know what to do. And this is really where, as Doreen will go a little deeper next uh, to these what we call normal reactions. If if we can get beyond the introduction of just being in denial and helping to forge what again Broffenbrenner. Uh, invites us to consider is the fact that we need to be both interpersonally available and intrapersonally dependent on our community to assist us to move beyond that denial to a more normal uh, or typical reaction. All right, Doreen, you had the next are those feelings. Okay, anger and denial, okay? Denial, I think you talked about it, um, just, uh, Tricia. Um, the first thing is denial. It, it didn't happen. And uh, there's this sense that this didn't really happen. I'm going to wake up tomorrow and everything's going to be fine. So there's this sense of denial. So it, it just gives you a very frustrating, it's a scary feeling. But then that, that thought goes into anger. And anger is when you just, I can't believe this is happening to me. This isn't fair. Your emotions bottle up inside of you. You're despaired. Why me? I'll do anything. Then they start bargaining. I'll do anything. Well, you know, I'll, I'll give you this much money if only you can. They, do, they will do anything to try to uh, restore it. And the anger is just... Uh, overwhelming to the um, adult. And then there's guilt. There's a phase of guilt where people will say, well, it's my fault. Maybe if I had been there, it wouldn't have happened. Perhaps if I had gone to see my mother more often, she wouldn't have got sick and died. Maybe if I had done this. And so this guilt is another reaction to grief. And it's normal. It's normal. Um, the next one is fear, sadness, and anxiety. There's fear. What do I do now? I'm alone. I don't know what to do. Who's going to help me? How am I going to pay for, you know, my mortgage without an income? What am I going to do if I'm sheltered in place for six months and can't work? These are all normal reactions. We have this fear and then we're sad and we're anxious and we just don't know what to do. And then when you're in that state of anxiousness, you know, you can go two ways. You know, you can either try to just stay there and wait and go along with the new norm, or you can say, deny it and say, oh, nothing's gonna happen. We're, I'm talking about the pandemic right now. Nothing's going to happen. Oh, it's not a big deal. And just go, go along your own way. Both ways are not really, really good. The best way is to kind of wait and wait till things are normal to, to change. We have to change. Be open to change. The next one is loneliness and abandonment. Oftentimes, people will feel abandoned. Uh, they're all alone, especially with the death of a loved one. Um, after the initial stages where people come and bring food and, and talk to you, there becomes a time when there's nobody there. And that's when the loneliness comes in and you feel abandoned and alone and what do I do? And that goes along with helplessness. Okay, and so we certainly see those thoughts and each of those has been described. And part of that then becomes those behaviors that each of the three of us have, have discussed. And what are the remedies of that? And, and those are the pieces that we're going to focus on as we look at the uh, next set of perspectives. And uh, Doreen's gonna move us through the perspectives of the age ranges of development because part of what you see in a child's behavior oftentimes is a result of what they observe adults in the environment communicating. 
So what we want to be able to help highlight, and I think it's probably obvious to all of us, is that during this pandemic, we as a nation, we as a world have been invited to begin to look at the fact that grief is a normal part of life and that we don't always get what we want, but that there are many resources available as we move through these continuums. And so uh, as you look at uh, these relationships, uh, simply as informational tools for you, um, the value of one in five children will experience death. Uh, by the age of 15. One in 20 will experience the death of one or both parents by the age of 15. And this is the continuum that we've kind of promoted up to this point. And the, the construct of that then is that, uh, let's see, we, we began with uh, denial. Uh, Doreen used those examples to discuss anger. And then the, the middle piece is kind of the construct of bargaining. And you'll notice that the, the lineage of these uh, five indicators aren't necessarily in a row. They're, they're absolutely not linear. They're elements of information uh, that in this case, uh, Trisha defined to you denial, uh, Doreen defined to you anger. Um, the value of bargaining, which I'll uh, move to, is the struggle to find meaning um, while invitationally, hopefully, there's enough sphere of influence in family and friends and community partners around you to truly reach in, allowing, offering, inviting, engaging one to tell their story. Uh, and then, uh, Tricia, you're going to kind of give us a thumbprint of what depression looks like, both from, uh, from a clinical perspective. So depression, when it comes to the grief cycle, is really all about feeling sad. It's when those, the anger and the denial just kind of floats away, or even the acceptance, and we, we, we stride back to this depression of feeling alone, overwhelmed, unsure of the world in front of us now that we've lost this, whether this is a child who loses their school and their friends and their teacher, their routine, um, a loss of a family member, loss of a friend, due to a car accident or just, you know, cancer or old age. So those kinds of things become this uncomfortable scenario for people outside of the person experiencing the depression. This person who's depressed is wanting to stay home usually, doesn't really want to communicate. There's no real social interaction going on. So a lot of people don't understand the best route on how to help them, how to support them. And a lot of that um, as far as the clinical side is really being there and being reassuring. So as a parent or a friend or another family member, being there and supporting them and saying, I understand that you're feeling this way and this sadness could last a long period of time or it could be short, but that I'm here because that helps reduce that helplessness, that, uh, that overwhelming feeling of being alone and that allows them to feel more supported and grow from that depression. Um, and continues that cycle of grief that, um, you know, depending on their support system can range from a few months to potentially a few years, depending on the loss. And Doreen, can you uh, further uh, define then the relationship of acceptance? Again, noting uh, to everyone here that there isn't a one at denial, a two at anger, a three at uh, a three at bargaining, a four at depression, and a five of acceptance, because some people ca can begin at acceptance and then find themselves rotating, you know, in this cycle. Uh, can you give us a little more information, uh, Doreen, on acceptance? Well, at this point, it isn't um, that you totally accept things, but you're not going to Im immediately be happy, but you kind of have well this is this is the way life is so you start to work on practical solutions to what's going on um you you figure maybe i can go to counseling maybe i can um 
find other resources, you aren't still thinking, oh, if only he was here. You, you start moving forward in a positive direction. Um, so, you know, you'll start looking forward, planning for the future, and eventually uh, be able to accept the loss of your loved one and anticipate good times in the future. And then furthermore, the next uh, value of that, and it's, it's certainly embedded in these five features, is the fact that as you look at the linear scale below, where we talk about information and communication, the value of what I call teaching to the affect, uh, how, how is our emotional attitudes and are they being supported? Those are the values of guidance and that lead to guidance and direction. Meanwhile, if you look back to bargaining, there's a small phrase in there called finding meaning and coupled in relationship to what Doreen spoke about concerning acceptance is the fact that we do look to acceptance as a way to find new meaning. And certainly within the construct of loss from uh, someone dying and someone, uh, you know, and death, is that we also look at it from the standpoint of the little toddler who, you know, the ball went over the fence and they, they can't get it. Uh, there, there is a grief of loss of that ball. Now we realize that that's momentary, but how do we find new meaning? And I, I would quote uh, from uh, Dr. David Kessler, uh, who wrote an outcome-based um, book on the next iteration of Dr. Kubler-Ross's uh, work. And, and found that as we look to the individual and or the community group, we begin to incorporate new insights and value to death. And what I call, how can we all plan for good death? And I think that as we look at the, the construct of death, none of us are looking forward to it, but if we across our planes of growth, help the child critically think about how to get the ball, not the fact that the ball is lost or that it's gone over the fence, but how do we get the ball back? That, that implies the development of critical thinking and problem solving and helping them move through that so that they can find that resolution uh, to the point that they can get, find new meaning of, oh, I can accept that by, you know, walking around to the gate with my teacher or my parent and getting the ball and retrieving it and then continuing the play. So the value of that uh, leads us to what uh, Tricia will talk about, those layers of grief. So as we talked about before, this process isn't linear. So because it's not linear, that also means they can overlap in emotions. So at one point we can be angry, but also depressed. So it's a weird combination, but it can occur. You can be bargaining and be upset and angry and it, you know, just trying to figure out where you're at at that point. And then let's say somebody does make it through the grief cycle. It, it happens. We get to a point where, like Doreen mentioned, we live our everyday lives. Things have adjusted. We've, we've made our new plan in life and moving forward. Um, the only thing that we need to remember is when that child loses that ball, if they have the inability to go retrieve it and it is gone, just because that moment or that time is over, doesn't mean later it's not going to, they're not going to be reminded of it. Oh my gosh, do you remember that ball? <gasps> that ball I had? And then they'll go through some part of that grief cycle for a short period of time again. So being able to understand that just because we've finished the process or it seems that we've finished the process, it will continue to touch us for the rest of our, our lives, potentially, um, depending on the um, extreme, um, what kind of, well, really what kind of loss it was. So uh, Doreen's gonna give us a very brief, and obviously the benefit of a presentation is that you can all take this back to your respective spaces and really uh, delve deep, more deeply based upon the particular age ranges of development that you're working with. But she's going to give us an overview of how we navigate that grief in relationship to ages, ages and stages. Okay. As you can see here, this is showing the age, the, thing, the concepts and beliefs that the child has, and what types of emotions you might see, and what possible behaviors you might see. 
and suggestions on how to help. So I'm not gonna read through every age group. I'm gonna concentrate more on the two to, uh, zero, to five, zero to five group, but it goes all the way down, I believe to age 18, is it 18 or 12? 18 and beyond. Yeah, there is an assumption in these particular uh, stages that once we're 18, we've got it all worked out as adults. <laughs> yeah, we don't. Okay, from so from zero to two, children do not understand depth, and in the very young child, they they notice changes. They will notice that you know, maybe somebody's not here. Uh, who's that person that used to feed me and hold me? They will notice. So you're gonna, they're gonna notice the changes. They're gonna notice that people are not happy anymore. They're crying or they're angry. So they're going to want, they're gonna reach out. They, they want that, the connection back again. They miss the contact. They miss the, if it's a parent that passed away, they miss the hugging or the, the playfulness that they had. They have fears. It's, is that person going to come back? Are things going to go back the same way? So they get anxious. So those are some of the possible emotions they're going to have. And the behaviors you might see in the very young are crying, um, throwing, rocking back and forth, sucking, biting, not sleeping well. So you're gonna see those kinds of things. This is zero to two. And then how you can help physical contact, reassure them as, as Trisha mentioned, they are seeking to safety. They need to feel safe. So just holding a child and rocking them is going to help them to feel safe and secure. Um, meeting their needs immediately, not letting them sit and cry, attend to them uh, right away. Include the child in the mourning process as much as possible. A lot of people think that just because they're zero to five years old or zero to two that, oh, they, they won't understand. We, we don't want to take them to the funeral. We don't, want to, we don't want to involve them and they keep them apart, but it's very important to include them in all of these things, okay? Be and, gentle and patient. And equally, what I would say in um, uh, complementing what uh, Doreen is saying from a theoretical standpoint, and these weren't necessarily mentioned in the uh, original theories nor in the, in the references, but as we well know, children at this age have a very important uh, role in that third column you see what's called emotions. And Eric Erickson, which is a world-renowned theorist in social-emotional growth, talks about the development of trust. And, and that's where it connects back to that bioecological model of building that physiological, uh, as well as the Maslow's uh, uh, hierarchy of building safety. Yeah. Yeah, from the therapeutic standpoint point as well, that connects because if they are left out of the process, then they feel segregated from the rest of the family, whether at that age point they understand that or not. Um, they too have to kind of see you go through those emotions so they can understand how to properly attach to people, how to find support from people, and how to grieve properly as they get older. So your emotional response to what's going on is huge for their brain development between zero and two with that sort of stuff. Thank you, Tricia. Right. So now if we move along to three to five, they still don't understand death. They think they don't realize that death is permanent. So they may wonder, oh, what's what's grandma doing? Where is grandma? You know, they don't understand the finality. Uh, they can't understand that the body stopped working. They might want, and then they might even wonder, well, what if what if the other parent dies or what if my sister dies? They, they don't know. Some of them have magical thinking. Oh, well, they're gonna come back as a ghost or they come and visit me in the nighttime. So they're gonna have all kinds of magical thinking, fantasies and other things that sometimes are even worse than the reality. So at this stage, the difficult emotions would be fear. They don't know what's happening, sadness, 
insecurity, confusion, anger, irritability, worried, guilty. Oh, if I didn't spill my milk, maybe daddy would still be here. They just don't understand the concept. Um, you're gonna see repetitive behaviors. They might ask questions over and over again. They might play out scenes of death. They might ask, act as if it never happened. So there, uh, there's a whole list of things, intense dreams, physical complaints, fighting. So it's very important at this time to allow the child, if they regress in their behaviors, as we mentioned before, some of them will, will regress to behaviors. If they're three and they're potty trained, they might regress to not being potty trained anymore. Okay, so we need to allow that, accept it and give them support Again, contact, allow them ways to express their feelings, simple truths, be truthful with them, maintain structure. And I'm going to go a little bit more into that in a, in a few slides. Uh, to, to transition us into the last portion, I think it's vital to say, and again, this is another uh, theorist, not certainly prominent in the first five years, which many of you are focused in on the first five years of life, although we provide you six to adulthood in these developmental perspectives, is that Barry Brazelton's features of bond and attachment are also vital in and throughout, not only the loss of whether it's as, as minimal as the ball to the death of grandma, is that you and I and our community continue to create platonic bonds and attachments to assist them from that difficult emotion through those behaviors onto the other side of acceptance. Uh, so again, we're not necessarily going to focus on the nine to 12 year old and 12 and beyond. Uh, isn't it interesting to imagine that a developmental stage at 12 plus means the rest of us, that we, we at least have those tenets in, in our midst uh, intellectually, but even those of us, you know, in early, middle, and late adulthood sometimes have difficulties manifesting them. And so, uh, uh, Doreen, you're giving us a kind of this construct of looking at the cope construct of death. Is that correct? Right. And I'm going to talk about how we should, what she, what, how we can help. So, Although it says be available and listen, I think the first thing is to get yourself me mentally stable. You know, make sure that you are not all, cra uh, all hyper and, and upset when you're talking with the child because you're going to be modeling for them. And if they see you upset, that's going to make them more upset. That being said, be available to the child. Listen to the child. If the child is having a tantrum or crying, go over to them. Don't tell them, oh, you're crying. Say, oh, what, what seems to be the, what, why are you crying? What's going on? And the child will tell you, oh, well, I'm sad. At that point, identify their feelings. Say, sad is okay. It's okay to be sad. Allow them to uh, grieve. Tell them that it's okay. Don't tell them, oh, Oh, don't be sad, everything's gonna be all right. Because then that child is now confused. She's not gonna have any sense of stability. Who can I talk to? They, I, I don't know what to do. They're gonna be in a state of confusion. So you wanna reassure them, it's okay to be sad. I get sad too. Tell me more about it, have them talk. Let them talk, don't do the talking for them. Answer their questions simply and honestly. And that's very critical, tell the truth. Don't say, daddy passed away. Oh, um, grandma is sleeping and she's not gonna wake up. Those are euphemisms that they don't understand. They're not gonna understand. That's gonna make that child think, oh my gosh, if I go to sleep, I might not wake up. Well, if daddy went on a long trip and he's not coming back, maybe if, Maybe I, don't, I shouldn't go on the trip because I won't come back. So this, this is going to confuse the children. Be honest. Mommy is dead. 
they they need to hear that mommy is dead now of course at three to five, zero to five they don't understand what dead is so you need to say to them dead when they're dead the body stops working there's no breathing mommy can't breathe they can't move this is dead okay and help the child to understand that and then that that's where we then connect between the role of the parent as she's described with that of the educating roles uh, uh my my perspective on this is the fact that we do need to be conscientious across our communities to be relatively sensitive and empowered to look at the ethnicities the value of family culture uh beliefs um the, the theoretical de definitions of those pieces when we look up the fact that we're made of many races that we come from different ethnicities that the cultural perspectives may differ across communities neighborhoods families and households uh based on gender based on sexual sexuality based on uh, uh, uh religions and and spirituality all of those features play a role not only in the construct of death but how we might handle just the loss of that ball that's gone over the fence uh how do we as a family and community value and uh, believe that we can contribute to healthy grieving you know i used the term earlier how do you plan for a good death well my answer to planning for a good death is that when I'm upset about the fact that, you know, I had a negative dollar in my bank account, how am I gonna solve that over, uh, well, there was an accident on the freeway today, and fortunately we were all right, but now I have to worry about the, the you know, I'm grieving over the loss of that automobile or whatever the construct is. Uh, and then Trisha gives us a, a support from a clinical perspective. So when it comes to trying to find somebody outside of your family unit that you need extra support say just this discussion with your child is just it's not comfortable it's not working you need more support um definitely connecting to what um norman was saying really find somebody in your community that relates and understands your culture your religion what your family needs as far as support um as a therapist i like to tell people when they come in for therapy you don't get along with me we can't build a relationship i don't have the knowledge for you you can fire me and find somebody else and a lot of the times that is what needs to be done and, and sometimes people get stuck in that um so being okay with saying no this this just isn't working for me this is specifically what i need being open to that and being willing to talk about the little things because that's the stuff that's really going to help um talk to your insurance companies look into the community ask friends ask your pastor, um, ask people at the school. Teachers have a lot of resources as well. Really look in your community to say, hey, this is what I, my family's going through and I'm needing extra support. Do you have anybody for me? Um, and they'll usually be able to point you in a direction. And like I said, sometimes they're um, culturally specific and sometimes they're not, but really ask those questions and be open to that. So as we put closure on some very basic elements that are extremely complex in application, Doreen's gonna finish us off with what we're calling the Child Grief and Loss Kit. And okay. I think that you're gonna see in just a moment, I'm actually going to um, modify the screen for just a moment so that you'll be able to see her actually point these out in about the last uh, two to three minutes, okay? And then we'll come back to the uh, presentation and uh, finish off. Okay, a, a very brief background. Uh, I, this kit was created after a, tra a series of tragedies in 2009 with one of our Head Start children. Uh, one of our Head Start children was murdered and then within two to three months we had another child die and then after that, we had five staff members die. And at that point, I felt that we needed to find something more in our resources to assist with the children. So that's how I created the grief kit. And what this is, is a, is a kit of activities, books, CDs, 
resources and materials to work with children. And it's we have five of these and one in each uh, for teachers to be able to either take the whole kit or parts of the kit and utilize them with children. So I'm gonna share, we have books in here, we have activities, um, we have CDs, and we have uh, some fun things here, arts and crafts. So I'm gonna start with one of my favorite things, and the favorite one is Spinoza. Spinoza is a bear who has a CD inside, Unfortunately, I didn't have any batteries, so I can't play it for you. And he sings songs. He's very huggable. And the way we would present this to children is say to them, you know, Spinoza is a bear who is here to help you. And you can cuddle him and hold him if you feel sad or angry or afraid. You can sit with Spinoza and we would provide a corner in the classroom where they could go one at a time to sit with Spinoza. And he's been very popular with some of our children. So this is Spinoza Bear. Then we also have, have what I call heart warmers. These are, these are handmade. This one you could purchase. This is a bigger one. This is called a comfy doll. And they're filled with flannel, uh, flax seed, and oh gosh flaxseed and essential oils. And you, you put them in the microwave for two to three minutes and it's warm and the child can hold them and feel comforted. Lavender, lavender is the essential oil, which will cause calmness, okay? We also have puppets that the children can use for imitation play. Sometimes children do not so much want to talk. They, they might be reluctant to talk, but when they're talking through the puppets, they can talk. So we have several puppets. We have arts and crafts supplies over here. We have pom-poms, crayons, uh, paper, sidewalk chalk. We have Play-Doh. And Doreen, and how about our highlight? <laughs> oh, are we running out of time? Okay, our highlight here, Spinoza Bear is no longer, the company is no longer here. So I discovered blue, my Blue Bee Bear. This is a Blue Bee, Bear, Blue Bee Pal Pro, and he's also soft and cuddly. But instead of having a CD, he has... Hi, my name is Blue Bee. Please connect me to the Bluetooth located on your device. He is Bluetooth enabled and he can read stories, he can connected play music now pair me with once he is connected. Or one of your other favorite so this is Bluebee and he's very soft and cut. Huh. What's that? Hello? Hello. My name is Norman and I'm calling and looking for Bluebee. I'm Blueby. Blueby, I'm feeling a little sad today. You are. My parents told me that I could call you and you would help cheer me up. I would love to cheer you up. I will give you a big bear hug. A beautiful bear hug? That would make me feel so much better. Would you like to come and sit with me for a while so I could hug you and sing to you? I would. Bye. <laughs> That's Blueby. That's our Blueby bear. <laughs> and as you can see for, from my shelf here, there are books. We have activity books. For those of you who are wondering, that we have activity books here for teachers with all kinds of activities you can do with the children. We have also a hand a, a book here from uh, New York Life. It is After a Loved One Dies, How Children Grieve, and it tells the parents what to expect, how to talk to their children, what they can do, and it's a really, really good resource here. 
And my other and between favorite- now and, and uh, connecting us back to the presentation, Doreen, I'm watching the chat window and there are a plethora of people who are saying, where do I get him? <laughs> I got them on Amazon, but, but he is made by Kaylee Products, K-A-Y-L-E. Very good. Well, thank you so much uh, for that opportunity to meet uh, the Grief and Loss Kit, and particularly uh, for Blueby giving me a virtual hug and making <laughs> me feel better because my doggy had to go to the vet today. I do want to, I don't want to miss out on showing this. This is from sesamestreet.org or sesameworkshop.org or Sesame Community. It is a confusing website. However, if you look hard enough, years ago they had the DVDs. It's all online. You can get this online immediately. But these have a story on how families grieve. They have, it's in English and Spanish. It has a DVD. All of this is on the website. And it also has a storybook in English and Spanish. And it's all about grieving. Very, very um, lovely uh, activities in here. So I really recommend that you, I think we have it in our resources. There's a link. Go on that website and look for grief. And they have lots of wonderful information. They even have Hit cards you can make for your kids to tell how they feel. Hope, listen, cry. And so I, I'm, uh, while she's finishing up, uh, you'll see all of the various activities that are identified uh, as far as the inventory in that. And then meanwhile, as we look at taking this information, certainly from a theoretical and a conceptual standpoint, back to our own communities, we look at the value of program and community-based services, determining, <clears throat> excuse me, how, how to assess, to seek, and actually receive those services. Uh, Tricia, you're talking about the construct of family and child counseling. Yes, when it comes to child and family counseling, um, I think the big thing is that when you take a child in who's going through some kind of grief or uh, difficult time, currently like this whole pandemic, um, getting in to kind of understand what they're going through, uh, bringing the family in and creating that family system of understanding so that you not only strengthen the child and their men mental health, but also the rest of the family because that builds on new ideas, new processes for the family to learn and grow together so that in the future, should another loss or grief, which will happen unfortunately comes along we are able as a family unit to work together to continue to stay strong and know how to support each other so as your child grows um, and you grow with them that um, building that framework that a basic need are all met and so you can work on how to continue to build a better person and um, a better process for the grieving situation and and following up then uh, comprehensively, we really, you know, leave you all with some reflective considerations that as each of you from an administrative level in your leadership to your uh, employees who are training and technical assistance to those directly in the classroom to those who are making uh, outreach to families consider these types of opportunities for breakout sessions at these various levels uh, from the standpoint that it simply gives the community an opportunity to express death and dying, which implies that there's a grieving and loss process in play, that building support groups, community outreach, uh, certainly from an organizational level, uh, things such as professional development, just as we're experiencing today, and then uh, examples of those could be day and, and uh, summer camp uh, uh, experiences for children. We're leaving you with um, certainly many types of resources, uh, children's resources, as well as family and community resources. Uh, here are our contacts. Tricia, would you like to offer any closing remarks? Um, I just wanna just remind everybody that 
it doesn't have to be the basic therapeutic approach. You don't just have to get a counselor. Um, look at the camps. There are groups for kids out there for loss along with groups for parents. Um, certain organizations like hospice do those kinds of things. Um, other community bases. Uh, churches are very beneficial, especially for the kiddos. Um, finding a group where you and your child don't feel alone and understand that in this process there are other people experiencing similar things allows that grieving process to potentially go a little bit smoother always going to be rocky um, be aware but as long as you have that extra support it it's definitely beneficial and i appreciate you guys being here today it's been wonderful to help spread this information so thank you doreen closing remarks well, I thank everybody for coming. Um, I think you said it all, Tricia, pretty much. But for young children, I think uh, what I would just stress to you is to just be there for the children and listen. I think I've listed all the, uh, the different uh, things in the PowerPoint, but I just think that you should um, just listen and be there and help provide safety for the children. You're, you're the one, the ones that are in the classroom, you're going to see them a lot. The parents, you're going to see them all the time. So we need to reassure them and help them to feel safe. And I think that's the most important thing. If I, if I didn't say anything else to say that, to, to just be there for the children, create routines so that they don't, don't get scared and feel safe. Well, thank you to both of you. I also want to, um, provide some closing remarks while also thanking uh, Region 9 Head Start, Edward Condon and uh, Jessica Lewis with Continued Ed for uh, sponsoring us to um, bring this together to provide you all with these resources. I, I would say to you as a, a, a formal educator that the primary educator is, is the family and we all must and need uh, to come together through all aspects of development, but certainly as, as Trisha used the word, it's always going to be rocky to grieve because it's something that we're having to uncondition ourselves from what has been a conditional taking for granted opportunity that's no longer there anymore. And that in and of itself means that developing our community and working together uh, certainly, as you see these references that we use to uh, bring this presentation together will hopefully be outreach uh, materials for you as well. And in final, the, the value of the Q&A, uh, we see there are many people who have uh, asked questions uh, as well as uh, probably, I think I at last counted over 175 different uh, <laughs> comments within the chat windows that uh, over the course of the next week, uh, Natalie will help us catalog those and uh, they'll provide them back to Trisha, Dorian and myself and we'll provide as many answers as we have the possibility to answer to all of you. Uh, meanwhile, providing it in a, um, uh, a BCC so that everyone's able to see the questions and answers because what one question comes from one person could be someone else's answer. And that again, relieves us with the audacious responsibility to handle it on our own. We're all in this together. So again, thank you all very much for coming. And uh, we look forward to communicating with you online uh, with this presentation. You see that we have our emails there. If things come up in the future, uh, we're certainly all available. So thank you very much and have a great day. Uh, thanks, Norman. Uh, I wanna thank Trisha and Doreen as well for their time and knowledge today. Uh, it was a, a, a very informative uh, presentation and we did see a lot of uh, positive and reassuring feedback on the chat. Just, uh, I just wanted to remind folks of a few things. Uh, the session was recorded uh, and will be made available in two different ways. One of them will be via the YouTube channel uh, where other recordings have gone up. By doing that, that uh, watching that session recorded plus the one live only qualifies for professional development hours. If you are interested in obtaining continuing education units, you have to go through continue.com. And, and to do that, 
I'll go ahead and share the link one more time on the chat. You have to follow that page and instructions are being uh, posted there. So again, the session was recorded and you'll be able to watch it again via YouTube. Uh, in regards to the questions, uh, we have done our very best to record all the questions that came in. Uh, the next thing for us to do is to obtain contact information and then we will share them over, excuse me, we'll share it over to Trisha, Doreen and Norman uh, for a follow-up. And that will happen, like Norman said, next week. So uh, if you do have uh, further questions or your question, we did not catch it live, uh, you wanna make sure you contact them via the email addresses that they provided on screen. Uh, I wanna thank everybody for your time today. We had a full house um, and I appreciate your time and I hope to see you on the next one. Thanks everybody, have a great day and be safe. Thank you. Take thank care. you. Thank you.